Okay, uh, this is uh, panel number two for the afternoon, they, uh, and the routine is uh, uh, open mic, open mic Friday. Anybody has a question for any any of the uh, any of us up here? Feel free uh, now or forever. Uh, shut up. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. He had his hands up right here. And by the way, this thing in his hand, you just throw that around. You just throw it, and so the next person catches it. Talking box. Talking box. Okay, is it working? Okay. Uh, my question is actually for uh, Dr. DiLorenzo, but I'd uh, like any of the panel, uh, particularly Newman, uh, Dr. Newman, to uh, weigh in on it. It's a historical question. Uh, Jefferson Davis, great president of the Confederacy or greatest president of the... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, <laughs> my questions... Uh, I ask that to my students sometimes. Uh, my question's actually, um, and I know I think where you lean on this, Dr. DiLorenzo, uh, but in your opinion, is Lincoln the worst president or Woodrow Wilson? Because you have, you know, both reasons for both of them, and I go back and forth myself, So I, and I'd be interested in Dr. Newman. Uh, or if there's somebody worse, you can have that in him as well. Well, of course, that's, <clears throat> that's sort of a softball question for me. That's... Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Lincoln was responsible for the death of far more people. Uh, the, the latest estimate of the uh, uh, Civil War deaths <clears throat> are as much as 850,000. Uh, for 100 years, the number was 620,000. But it, it seems to be accepted by even the mainstream now that it's between 750 and 850. Uh, and this is at a time when the population of the U.S. was one-tenth of what it is today. So it would be as much as eight and a half million Americans dying in four years <clears throat> in, a, in a war, mostly here in the South. Well, you know, <clears throat> Get, <clears throat> excuse me, Gettysburg was the only battle really uh, in the North, uh, as far as that goes. And so, uh, so yeah, I, I would put him <laughs> in the, uh, for, for a lot of reasons. I could stand up here for a couple hours and tell you the reasons why that, but um, maybe Patrick has, has something to say. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, as I explain in my uh, forthcoming books, uh, Wilson Unmasked and the Real Wilson, um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> uh, I would just, I would say Wilson because, I mean, you, you have World War One, and, you know, at least... At least Lincoln didn't pass a central bank. We had a quasi-central banking system. So, but Wilson, we got the Federal Reserve, but they're equally bad. I, I, I would, I, I at least side with uh, Ivan Eland. He has a book, Recarving Rushmore, where he ranks the presidents. I don't agree with all the rankings, but I do agree with the one who's at the top, or I guess the bottom of the list in terms of the worst, and I would, uh, Wilson. But that's, uh, but that, that's just me, I guess. I would, I would say that. He's more politically correct than I am. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, sir, over here. You don't get to ask if you drop that thing, by the way. <laughs> right over here? All right. Um, so my question is uh, for pretty much everybody on the panel. Uh, we just had a talk today with Ryan McMakin about decentralization as a path to anarcho-capitalism. And Tho Bishop, he's going to give his lecture tomorrow on economic populism. And these are kind of strategies for how do we get to the end goal? Because something <clears throat> as libertarians we're really good at is talking about the causes of problems, the solutions to problems, but we, what we don't do enough is talk about how we get there. So I wanted to ask everyone in the panel about what they personally think is the best strategy to getting to the end goal. Uh, any strategy that works, um, and every and every strategy that works uh, should be used. Uh, I would point to the uh, marijuana legalization movement as something that's very interesting and potentially very powerful. In that, in the states, you have voters directly, you have legislatures acting independently, you have courts acting independently. Uh, all to strike down the power of the federal government um, and even international law of the UN. So that's something that was done, you know, in the state of Colorado, independently, against the law, against the wishes of the governor and the state legislature, and they made it happen. They opened the door for all these other states. Um, to go in that same direction, and the same model 
can be used in any number of different areas for states to withhold their authority and um, agreement with uh, various parts of the federal government seriously undermines uh, the type of authority that the UN and the federal government would like to have and the less um, of that kind of power that they do have, the better. You might, uh, <clears throat> as a footnote of that, uh, check out the web suit, well, website of the Abbeville Institute, abbevilleinstitute.org. Uh, Don Livingston, the founder of it, uh, uh, he, he says that you know Americans are too, especially, are too conditioned to thinking horizontally about politics, left and right. You know, if only we can get our person in. If only we can get Ron Paul as president. Well, even if we got Ron Paul as president. Uh, they would do the same thing to him in spades that they did to Trump, you know, sabotage every every move he, he tried to make. <clears throat> and so, uh, and he says we need to think more uh, ver uh, vertically. That is, uh, like Ryan McMakin said, uh, decentralized power and, uh, and nullification is essentially what Mark is referring to. I, I think nullifying federal marijuana laws, and uh, and I'd like to see that a, a massive proliferation of that occurring along with secession. Thomas Jefferson thought uh, there would be at least three confederacies, even during his time in the 1820s. He said that, and he said we would—they will all be our children, uh, meaning all be Americans, and we would wish them well. And then you fast forward to Lincoln, and he says, "Pay up or die" to to any state that wanted to secede. Very. So he was the anti-Jefferson. Uh, yeah, these two guys—you can you can arm wrestle to see which one of you uh, goes first. Uh oh, he gets he gets to ask the question. He gets to ask the question. Okay, you guys, are you sure? I mean, that was bad. That was a bad fumble. Yeah. Well, oh that, my god. That was okay. not exactly a Tom Brady pass, so you can go ahead. Yeah. So I'm not an athletic person, to say the least. However, uh, going off of Payton, I was curious um, about your you guys' thoughts on nonviolent tactics. Uh, an author specifically I have in mind is Gene Sharp. If any of you are familiar, so yeah, stuff like you know protests, uh, sit-ins, um, pickets, you know stuff like that. I mean, that's what a lot of the American revolutionaries did. Uh, I think you know, so I, I think those tactics are good. Always, there's always a fine line between what comes to an invasion of public property or or you know looting, et cetera, which 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 I wouldn't support. But uh, nonviolent civil disobedience is certainly libertarian it's something you pursued i mean it's obviously you want to use it at the right time with the right uh problem at hand uh anything i mean one of the issues that's always going to happen is is the media is always going to call a protest they don't like like a riot you know and the riots they do like is protests kind of so you know you you, you do get that but it's certain certainly a tactic to, to 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 try i mean as long as it's again done respectfully and civilly and and it, it's, it's at a time when it can make a difference. Yeah. So I think that's a pretty ineffective yeah, strategy, actually, to be, to be honest. Uh, making signs will not change a whole lot. Uh, voting will definitely not change anything. Um, I think the effective strategy is to engage in counter economics, start businesses, step outside of the institutional framework, do new things in new ways, and build new free market institutions within the uh, shell of the old and replace, stop, first stop feeding the beast and then replace the beast's tentacles one by one by starting businesses. You might want to read a book by the late Harry Brown. It's called How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. He was a Libertarian Party candidate for president several times. Yes, sir. From, from the past, good. Oh, no, you, you had your, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about oh. that. I forgot, you didn't ask your question. Yeah, so my question is uh, for Professor Trell. Uh, so basically, after the lecture about uh, this government land owned and everything, I was thinking, is there like any literature on, or any policy that uh, we could think of to privatize all that land? Or is there any, anything on it? Like, uh, If you're talking about privatizing like public lands, um, that is, um, I think you could see some movements in that direction with some subcontracting, but that's only a slight movement. Uh, I think you'd have to 
see, you, you'd have to communicate to people the abject failure that federal land management and state land management has been. Um, the, uh, the government is not really using these lands to, the, to, their, to their best purpose. And um, it's gonna take a widespread acknowledgement of that fact before anything actually happens as far as government selling off land or giving it away. I would be perfectly happy if the government decided to give a Yellowstone to the Sierra Club um, or the Audubon Society or something. And it just, it, it doesn't have to go to, you know, the highest bidder necessarily as long as it winds up in, in private hands. I think that would be fine uh, as an intermediate solution. Check, check out the website of Political Economy Research Center, perc.org, PERC, in Montana. They've been working on this for 40 years. And, uh, and they, have, they, have, they do have a huge literature on this. They have, a, they have a whole program on what they call enviropreneurship. And it's a lot of ranchers and farmers in the Western states who are in business, who are, who are finding ways to, uh, to privatize land and to solve uh, problems with the land through free markets and private property solutions rather than government regulation and dictates. And so uh, that, that's what you, if, if you're interested in the literature, that's where you need to go. I would add too on that. There's uh, groups like Nature Conservancy and the American Prairie Reserve that are taking land and basically holding it in trust in, in, its, in, their, in its natural state. And when people can see that kind of contrast where there's a private organization that's fulfilling that same function and doing a better job of it, then that might help people to see that we don't need government to, to engage in conservation. Right, thank you so much. Uh, this is for Dr. Balloon. Um, you're obviously an entrepreneur. You teach entrepreneurship at Wellman State. I was wondering. Those are not the same things. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Uh, so I was. Uh, you, you obviously see entrepreneurship as a tool to bring younger students into the Austrian school. You know, we have a lot of entre young entrepreneurs in this generation. So, do you think this tool can be used efficiently in the future to bring in young Austrians? And if not, what can we do? I think there are more than one strategy that could work for this. Um, but as I said in my first talk, I, I, successful and experienced entrepreneurs are Austrians. They don't know it. Right? So if we, can, if we can reach them, if we can talk to them and give them the terminology and give them any, some insight into that, that there is already a theory explaining what they know, even though they don't have words for it, we can gain a lot. And I don't mean just do in donations <clears throat> to the Mises Institute. I, I mean in terms of influence everywhere and helping them also to succeed. Because, yes, they know a lot. They've learned a lot. They have a lot of experience. So they have this tacit knowledge of how the market process works. But we can help them understand it a little better. Uh, so I, I think that is definitely a, a way forward. But it's not the only way forward. So my question is about secession. Um, from an Austrian perspective, this is for anyone, how would you view Chaz as cousin, kind of like an expression of secession? And in addition to that, why did Chaz fail? And why are these like pockets of kind of BLM oriented secession efforts? How would we view that and why have those not worked per se? So what do you? Chad, what are, what are you talking um, about? Yeah. <laughs> you mean when these lunatics Ch took, took over part of the, In the Seattle. town? In Seattle, right, uh, right. Yeah, Chaz. Well, that was a you know, violent insurrection and imposition of private property is what that was. I mean, they, they crapped all over people's homes and, and, and businesses, and, and that, that, was, uh, that was just law-breaking. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't consider that any kind of, uh, to have been an act of secession of any kind. Um, in, in the American uh, tradition, when the southern states seceded, uh, you have to understand, you know, if you, since you use the word secession, first of all, when the Constitution was ratified, Rhode Island, New York, and Virginia all reserved the right explicitly to secede if the federal government interfered with what they called their happiness. And they all insisted that we have that right and that right is not dependent on any other state or any other group of states voting that it's okay for us to secede. We reserve the right. And when they were accepted into the union, all the other states assumed that right, the same right. 
and so, and so when they seceded, when the southern states began to secede, they did the same thing that they did when they held the ratification conventions. They held a de they held de ratification conventions and popular votes uh, to to go about it. They didn't take over a part of the uh, a city and ruin people's businesses and burn down their homes and shoot people and and, uh, and beat them up if they tried to protect their own property like these lunatics. Uh, uh, what was it, Chad? I don't know what they, they called that. They're the city. Uh, and so I think that's, a, that's not a, really not an appropriate uh, comparison at all if you want to talk about the American tradition of secession. Oh, the man in the way in the back there. Let's, uh... For Dr. Terrell. Um, specifically about, I, I was, I've been spending some time reading about Thomas So and concerned the question about how the administrative structure of the university has grown over the last, you know, decade. Um, and I wanted to get your thoughts on it. So, and, and does this stem from the fact that a lot of students are mismatched with the universities they go, they go to largely because of either affirmative action policies or, you know, no child left behind type of policies because, you know, Dr. So would say, you know, when he was at, it was at Cornell, um, some students who, because you're expected to be reading at the level of the 95 percentile at Cornell, and some of the students who probably read at 75 percentile, which is great, um, are admitted to Cornell. And many times you see the students um, failing out of class because the professor expects them to be reading at this level and teaches them at that level. So is that, and because a lot of them, um, what's the word? drop out of school, and that's not good for the university structure. University, they create this huge <clears throat> administrative structure around university to create like remedial classes, support for the students, and that might have unintended consequences. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that in general. Yeah, one of the things that I didn't mention earlier today is that yeah, colleges and universities are, universities are dealing with some of the problems that are coming out of failures in K through 12. And so there's more of a, uh, a need for uh, college classes to make up for the lost ground um, that students have when they, when they come out of high school. They, they, they don't have the um, verbal and, and quantitative skills that we would expect them to have and they, they, that they might have had in the past. And so colleges and universities are starting with um, in some cases, students that aren't prepared for college work. And the incentive that colleges have financially, largely because of government subsidies, is to um, kind of coax these students along and maybe fudge uh, the requirements a bit to, um, to allow the college to continue to collect taxpayer dollars. And um, there's Colleges sometimes will um, either turn a blind eye to problems like plagiarism or they will um, kind of impose slap on the wrist kinds of penalties for these kinds of things. And, and it, it, it's hurting the students who do come in prepared. Uh, you couple that with grade inflation and some other, uh, other ways that colleges and universities have tried to adapt to that, that ill-prepared student. And uh, you end up with um, the the kind of uh, degradation of the of the value of the degree. Um, so I, I am not sure how to solve that, but a part of that is going to have to start with K through 12, and um, it's it's a problem that's I think pervasive um, across across public and private institutions. They're still facing some of the same problems. Yeah, it's one. 20 or 25 years ago, a woman named Rita Kramer wrote a book called Ed School Follies. She went all over and, uh, and, and studied educate, schools of education to learn what teachers are taught, you know, people who are getting degrees in education. She went to Harvard and Stanford, and then she went to small schools, colleges, and wrote this whole book. And she concluded that the average teacher, uh, like if you, were, if you have credentials in English, you would never have read actual Shakespearean plays. You would have read Cliff Notes summaries of Shakespeare's plays. And so she concluded that the average teacher, there are exceptions, of course, is, is grossly uneducated. 
uh, as far as that goes. There, there are many ex exceptions, of course. Uh, you know, all of us have had, uh, you know, can, can name good teachers that we had if we went to public schools, as I did. But, uh, but that's, I think that's a part of it, too, that uh, Tim is referring to. And that was tw about 20, 20 or 25 years ago. And my impression is worse now than it was uh, schools of education. When it, my first year in graduate school, I worked for, uh, as a research assistant for Gordon Tullock and Richard McKenzie. They were writing a textbook, and they made a bet with me one day at lunch. They said uh, in, in McKenzie's class of 300 freshmen, he, and they listed on the roster all the majors of everybody, he said, I bet every single education major will flunk the test. I took the bet, and I lost. And, I, and that, was, that was 40 years ago, that, uh, that, and so it's probably worse today. Let me add something too, because both Tim and, and, and Tom uh, have talked about the lack of knowledge when, when students come to the universities, and that's part of the problem, because we should expect people to have a certain level of knowledge on all these different things. One thing that I've struggled with teaching entrepreneurship is that students know the wrong things. They have been miseducated, right, because they've been taught through quick, K through 12, uh, some weird stuff that yeah. I don't know where it comes from. So it seems like the teachers too are either uneducated, miseducated, or just ideologically driven. Yeah, I had a, a sophomore economics student that uh, when I, when I tr uh, try to teach him how uh, voluntary trade is mutually advantageous between buyer and seller, it was like a light bulb went off in his head and he said, well, I've been taught that businesses basically take advantage of people's wants. You know, if people have wants, they take advantage of them. And, and, and he went through 12 years of private Catholic school, and that's what they taught him about economics. And so I had to do what, uh, what Pear is saying and uh, reprogram him and his classmates from this foolishness that the, their heads are filled with, and they're paying 60000 a year to, their parents are paying 60000 a year uh, for this. Other question? After Lincoln's death, of course, the, uh, Andrew Johnson became president, and the radical Republicans were not fans of him. I was wondering what your, your uh, opinion was of Andrew Johnson. Uh, well, since the, the radical Republicans tried to kick him out, uh, tried to kick him out, uh, he must have been a pretty good guy, as far as, far as that's uh, concerned. And uh, you know, what can I say? He was, uh, but he was, you know, he was a, a Republican. And he was the vice, pre uh, you know, the vice president. So he was a part of the Lincoln regime, and so uh, he's probably uh, he's his, he's probably uh, as a result of being part of the Lincoln regime. In my opinion, his next door neighbor today is probably either Hitler or Stalin or one of the guys down there. You know, that's, 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 as far as as far as in my in my opinion. Uh, we talked a lot about how universities are kind of teaching economics. Um, in more Keynesian and in more uh, mainstream ways. I was wondering if you guys could talk about uh, the argument of why students should get an economics degree um, if they're at a college where they're very reluctant to teach free market ideas. In order to defeat the enemy, you have to know him. But um, no. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> no, I mean, I, I think, well, one, it depends on what you want to do for, for a career. Uh, so getting an economics degree is just in general like a signal, right? It signals a certain level of intelligence, a certain level of conformity, persistence, et cetera. So going to a mainstream program uh, and doing that, especially if you have to do a good amount of math, like that could be good for finance, uh, for finance degrees, for private sector. It's a good analytical just helps you think logically, even something like with basic graphs and, and math. It's, it could be tougher than a lot of business degrees. Uh, in other sorts of social science degrees where there's a lot of fluff. Uh, so, uh, and, 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 it, and it does train you to, I, I, I got my undergrad at a place that was not friendly to Austrian economics, but, uh, you know, here I am, right? Um, so uh, I, I, I would still encourage you, I encourage you to get an economics degree, uh, whether it's Austrian-based uh, or not. Um, again, it's partially, if you want to get a PhD, it's good in, in academia. If you want to just work in the private sector, uh, again, it depends on, depends on the job, but, uh, there are benefits to, to, to learning, 
the other side because you, you you think critically. Um, so yeah, I, I would just say I would say that. But one of the things you have to remember is that um, all the other degrees in the social sciences, the humane sciences, uh, they've all got huge problems as well. Um, and you can't just say, well, how about history? Uh, because there's a lot of problems, a lot of uh, extremely left-wing history professors. Um, so you're going to get pretty much nothing but misinformation, whereas you'll get bits and pieces of good information even from uh, mainstream economic programs, and you'll learn about what's so wrong with the economics discipline and economic education uh, in the process directly. I'll tell you a, sh a short anecdote. I used to hand out a, uh, a magazine article to my principals of economics students. It was an interview with Bill Belichick, the New England Patriots coach. He was an economics major in school. And he said, every decision I make as a coach is based on what I learned about marginalism in, in economics. So you don't, you don't have to get a degree to understand that. But I used to use that when I taught opportunity cost and trade-offs in, in the principals class. Uh, and uh, so you might you might want to look for that online. It's probably ten years old now at the time. Plus, Bill Belichick likes deflation too, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's a deflationist. Yeah, yeah deflationist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, how about this guy back here in the white coat? Last one. Oh yeah. Oh, him, and then behind you. Okay. We all know, based off of theory, that you know a freer society, whether it's anarcho-capitalist or minarchist, you know, would be much better than anything we currently have, right? This being said, though, you know, we're so far away from a society that any of us in this room would consider ideal. So, what I want to ask is, uh, do you guys think that humanity is just condemned, you know, for the rest of history to be constantly <laughs> fighting the state? <laughs> Well, that's the battle between liberty and power. I mean, that's that's what's been going on throughout history, and that's that's that's. There's always people who want to get special privileges. So the only way we can defeat that is through greater, greater education. But humans aren't perfect, so yeah, we'll probably be in that battle. Now there'll be different degrees of victory. Sometimes liberty liberty will be winning. Sometimes power will be winning. But uh, we're always going to be we're always going to be fighting error. Uh, we're always going to be fighting economic fallacies, so we'll always be fighting the, 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 the long arm of the government, un unfortunately. Uh, I, I communicated with Ron Paul a while back, and uh, he asked me what I was doing. I told him about a book I was writing, and, and I told him it, uh, it seems futile, though, doesn't it? And his response was to say, he said, uh, well, at least it makes life interesting. Uh, <laughs> and then our old friend Gary North once said uh, uh, what he thinks, a lot of what he does, you know, in writing articles and things is, is basically uh, peeing on the front steps of City Hall and running away. He said, you can't, you can't defeat City Hall, but you can at least harass them. In, 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 in some way. And it's kind of fun to do that. Uh, okay, so yeah. we, have, we can answer a question outside. I think we got... Hey, we're all done. I guess it's, it's 4.15, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>